Over the last few months, there have been several high-profile security compromises covered in the news. Most of them, and all of the ones that I've covered here on my channel, have included phishing as a significant component of the attack. When things like this happen, security professionals and news outlets alike, myself very much included, tend to recommend multi-factor. Now, while any multi-factor is better than none, not all types of multi-factor are created equally. In fact, just a few months ago, there was a widespread phishing campaign that targeted multiple organizations and companies. One of the ones that was compromised was Twilio. Twilio, among other things, provides texting services. So if you've ever gotten a code texted to you that you needed to log in, there's a strong possibility that Twilio is the one that sent you that text. When the attackers got access to Twilio, they were then able to get access to those codes, and in fact used one to impersonate a journalist. As far as I'm aware, only one company claims to have been targeted by that attack and successfully prevented being compromised by it, and that is Cloudflare, which describes their success to having rolled out FIDO keys to all of their employees. Now, what's FIDO? How does it relate to similar technologies such as web authentication and pass keys? And how can you use it in your life? My name is Eldridge. I've got over a decade of experience in information security and IT. And today I'm going to break down what FIDO is, what the next generation of authentication technology looks like on the web, and how you can use the parts available today to make you or your organization safer. Before I dive into FIDO, I want to take a look at some of the attack types that FIDO is specifically created to prevent, most notably phishing. Phishing, as you're probably aware, is when a malicious actor tries to get you to send them your credentials, hopefully without you even noticing. Now, before multi-factor became widespread, that typically looked like this. Let's take a hypothetical. Let's say I want to compromise your Gmail account. I would probably send you a link that would take you to a page that looked exactly like gmail.com. If you looked up in the URL bar, HTTPS would be turned on and it would even say gmail.com. It's just that it would be followed by eldridge.com. Now in this example, because I own eldridge.com, I can put whatever I want to the left of it, including gmail.com. And that's what allows me to have the HTTPS working because I actually do own the root domain. The hope is that you would just look up, see Gmail if you looked up at all, and assume that it's working correctly. Now, this is a hypothetical. This wouldn't happen this way in real life, and that's because I don't own Eldridge.com. It's owned by a multi-billion dollar investment firm, which refuses to sell me the domain, which personally, I find rude. But going back to the example, when you typed in your password, that would go to me at Eldridge.com, and I would be able to use that to log in as you anytime I want. And so multi-factor was added to this to raise the bar for attackers. Now, instead of typing in a password, you have to either type in a code or accept a push notification on your phone. And either of those are only valid for somewhere between about 30 to 90 seconds usually. So the attacker can't take the credentials you send and reuse them indefinitely. But attackers are adaptable. And now a lot of phishing technology will take your code or your accepted push notification and turn around and automatically log into your account at which point it's just like as if you checked save my sign in on gmail.com. The attacker has access to your account for 30 days or so. During that time, they can attempt to compromise other things or even attempt to add other multi-factor methods so they can continue to log in as you. Phishing is often a part of a chain that is used to successfully compromise organizations. And so while phishing rarely compromises someone just by itself, it's used in a chain of other things, and it's still a significant component of that chain. And all of the attacks I've covered so far on this channel have included phishing. So in an attempt to raise the bar for attackers, engineers started adding that second factor. Now, factors of authentication are broadly split into three categories. There's something you know, something you have, and something you are. Something you know is the one you're probably the most familiar with. It's exactly what it sounds like, something you can keep in your head, like a password or a pin code. Something you have is usually your phone. It could also be your laptop or a USB key. And then something you are usually refers to biometrics. So if you unlock your phone or laptop with your face or fingerprint, you're using a something you are factor of authentication. And now historically, as you know, lots of accounts just used the something you know usually just the password. And that worked okay for a little while. Passwords are about 50 years old. 
They were not made to live in this world of 3 billion people connected on the internet, with devices and services being connected almost all of the time. And so engineers combined the password with a something you have factor to make a stronger defense. And this raised the bar for the attackers. However, as I mentioned earlier, this is still susceptible to more advanced types of phishing. At the end of the day, this type of multi-factor is a band-aid on the solution of passwords that were just not made for the modern environment. When engineers were designing what would eventually become FIDO, they turned to a different type of technology, known as asymmetric cryptography, or public key cryptography. Now, what you probably use for most of your life is actually symmetric cryptography. This is what's used when you log into a website with your password. And how that works at a basic level is when you create your account, you create a password. The service takes that password and transforms it using what's called a salt and a hash. And then it stores that version of the password. What that does is allow them to test and see if your next login matches, but it makes it very hard to get your original password back out. So the next time you attempt to log in, they take your login attempt, use that same salt and hash to transform, and then see if that matches what they have on file. If it does, you're let in, hence symmetric. Then, if anyone compromises their servers and sees their database of salted and hashed passwords, they're not easily able to get the original password back out. It's not easy, but it is possible. And that's because symmetric cryptography fundamentally means that they have some version of the thing you're using to log in. And so engineers turned to asymmetric cryptography. This works in a very different way. It works by creating a key pair, a public key and a private key. And how these work, there's an excellent explanation that I've linked down in the comments, but at a high level, you can think of this as being a box with a lock on it that can exist in three positions. There's either all the way to the left or all the way to the right, which is the locked position, or there's the middle, which is the unlocked position. You can think of the key pair as being a private key, a key that can only turn clockwise, and a public key, a key that can only turn counterclockwise. So if someone wanted to send you a message, they could put a message in the box, use their copy of your public key to turn the lock all the way to the left, and know that only you with your private key could unlock the box and read the message. And this is the technology that underlies end-to-end -end encrypted messaging apps, such as Signal, WhatsApp, or iMessage. This can also work in reverse. You can place a message in the box and lock it with your private key, turning it all the way to the right. And then anyone with your public key can open the box and read the message. Now your public key is public, so that doesn't do much to keep your message private. But what it does do is let the message recipient know that you were in fact the one that sent it. That component is the tech that powers FIDO. In moving to prevent phishing, they had to look away from symmetric cryptography. So engineers turned to asymmetric cryptography. Now, asymmetric cryptography has been around for a while. It's well-tested and used in a lot of high security applications. However, it's never been the most accessible or usable. So when engineers were creating what would eventually become FIDO, a big component was making sure that this was easy to use. Going back to our box metaphor, what happens is when you attempt to sign into a website with FIDO, they send you a message and you respond and lock that response in that box with your private key. The box goes to the service, which can then unlock it with your public key. And if they get the message they're expecting, they know to let you log in. And they still don't have any insight into your private key. So that means if they get compromised, there's no version of your key that an attacker can attempt to reverse engineer. Now this comes with a couple of really neat properties, and the most significant one is origin binding. And that's what makes FIDO theoretically fish-proof. Origin binding means the login is tied to the domain itself. So going back to our phishing example, let's say I'm trying to compromise you by sending you to gmail.com.elders.com, but you're using FIDO. When you attempt to log in using FIDO, that actually does send a FIDO login attempt to me. However, it's bound to the elders.com domain. So I cannot use that to turn around and do anything to Google, and I don't have any version of your private key that, that I can extrapolate. So it's pretty useless, and that makes phishing fairly impossible. And another really neat result of having origin binding is it makes it very different from passwords. As you've probably been told, it's a bad idea to use the same password on multiple sites. However, most people have many, many accounts online 
And unless you use a password manager, that's basically impossible. And so you're told to have different passwords for every site. Well, because this is using asymmetric crypto, you can use the same key for every single site you log into with no compromises to your security. So now, how does this work in practice? There's been a few iterations and they've gotten more easy and usable over time. And one of the reasons I think that this is coming up more and more in recent months, even though this has been around for a little while at this point, is because pass keys have come out. And I'll get into those in a second, but that's basically the easiest way to use this type of technology that's been made available. But let's go back a few years to before FIDO was a thing and the predecessor was called U2F. That's the same basic technology and it relied on hardware tokens. So usually a YubiKey like this made by the company Yubico. There were a few other manufacturers including Phaeton and Google. And how this worked was the private key is stored securely on this device. It can't actually leave this device. So when you attempt to log into a site, I have to plug this in, tap the side of it, and that's going to do that signature. Lock the box that I mentioned earlier. So this was great. And a lot of security conscious organizations rolled this out. However, this was not the most accessible or usable. Smaller organizations or individuals couldn't really be expected to drop $15 to $70 on a couple of keys just to make sure they could sign into their accounts okay. So the technology that's in these keys was actually starting to be included in phones and laptops and is now pretty pervasive. If you unlock your phone or laptop with a biometric, it's probably because there's a similar chip inside your device. Now they're all a little different. iPhones have secure enclaves, Macs have T1 or T2 chips, Windows devices have TPMs, Android has Trust Zone, but they all do this asymmetric cryptography. And so that means that people could not have to get a separate key, but they could actually use their phone or their laptop as their second factor device directly. Now this was much more accessible. You didn't have to buy additional hardware, but it was still not the most accessible. And that's because that private key would exist only on that device. So let's say you create a Twitter account and use Fido on your phone. Then if you try to log in on your laptop, you would not be able to without trying to use your phone as an authenticator somehow. So normally you would need to add your laptop as a second device. So trying to do that across all of your accounts with all of your devices was a little bit prohibitive. And so the version that's come out now is pass keys. And pass keys have a slight reduction in security for a great gain in usability. And frankly, if you're taking a slight hit in security, but it means you're using a much, much more secure login method on way more sites than you would have otherwise, the net is a positive for security, in my opinion. And so how pass keys work is the private key is not stored on your phone or your laptop or a hardware key directly. It's actually stored in your ecosystem account. Using Chrome or Android, it's saved to Google. Using iPhone or Safari, it's saved to your iCloud account. Now it's encrypted so those companies don't get visibility into your private key and it's synced between all your devices. So if you set up a Twitter account on your phone and you go to your laptop, you're able to log in to Twitter directly. Now attackers are adaptable and like Fire, they follow the path of least resistance. And so as Fido becomes more and more popular, what I expect is that they will use password recovery or account recovery tools. So that's usually where the accounts are going to be the weakest if Fido is turned on. If you have Fido and someone can get into your account by answering a few security questions or by using a backup code, they'll try that before trying to compromise your Fido. So if you're using Fido, Basically, you need to be very aware of when an account login asks you to use something other than FIDO, such as a backup code. That is when the fishers will be trying to get you the most. Now, some accounts, you can actually remove any other types of authentication besides FIDO. In fact, if you have a Google account, you can turn on advanced protection and it will prohibit any login attempt that does not use FIDO. Some accounts, you have to have a backup code and that's fine. I think as we move towards FIDO, it's going to be a gradual move across the industry and across consumers. However, that is something you want to keep an eye on. If you ever get asked for a backup code, that's the time that you're most likely going to be fished. So just be extra cautious when things like that are happening. Now, some of you may have been thinking as I've been going through this, multi-factor or at least the six digit codes and the push notifications were a band-aid on passwords, which were just not ready for this modern environment. So if instead of those types of multi-factor, we use asymmetric crypto-based multi-factor, it's so strong, do we really even need the password anymore? And the answer is no. So I'm going to be posting some more videos soon 
on the journey that the industry is taking to passwordless. And that's the next generation of authentication technology that we're gonna see roll out soon. I'm also going to do some more information on passkeys and how that works. So stay tuned if you wanna learn more about those things. But FIDO is something you can use today. It's already available on some main services such as Google, Facebook, and Twitter. It's also available on login.gov if you're in the US or bestbuy.com, weirdly. So when this video is done, you can go to your account settings and enroll with FIDO, whether it's using a YubiKey, your phone, or a passkey. And now you might see it referred to as web authentication in some places. I'm going to break that down later in another video, but web authentication is basically the technology that FIDO relies on that provides that asymmetric crypto. So anywhere where you can add a security key, a FIDO key, or a WebAuthn key, that's going to use this asymmetric crypto to protect your accounts. And you can set that up in just five minutes and make your accounts as close to fish proof as is possible today. So check back here if you'd like to learn more about the passwordless journey that the industry is taking, about pass keys, or if you have any questions about the stuff I've covered today, feel free to drop them below in the comments. And Fi don't forget to like and subscribe. I told you that wouldn't land.